Good morning, good afternoon, or depending on where you're watching, good evening and good night. <laughs> it is, what day is it? Oh my goodness, it's it's Tuesday. No, it's Thursday, April, we'll fix it in post. It's Thursday, April 11th. Replay crew, love you. Everything's gonna be timestamped down below. We have a lot to cover today. Um, I don't normally cover breaking news, but we were going to do quick bits and there are a few news items we will talk about in quick bits. I am going to also be covering the evidence the prosecution wants to admit in the Corey Richens preliminary hearing. Just a quick note on that. I have seen media outlet after media outlet, including like Court TV, have the date of the preliminary hearing wrong. I don't think they're scouring the docket the way that I have been trying to keep up with this case. But the preliminary hearing date is not, not April 17th. It was pushed to May 15th. So if you see news articles that this prelim is coming up um, in in um, in what a couple of days, that's not accurate. It has um it has uh been pushed out to May. We are also going to cover the defense's sentencing memorandum. Is there a a hope in my heart that the prosecution's sentencing memorandum for Hannah Gutierrez will drop as we are streaming. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I hope to see it. Do I think we'll probably see it Friday? Yep, probably. Yep, probably. And with all of that, we had a very long stream last night. I'm going to summarize a little bit of that for those of you that are like, but girls, sleep is a priority. It is. It is a, it is a priority. I should have prioritized it more. I <laughs> I wore the purple today. I'm like, will the purple distract from the exhaustion? Maybe. Solid plan. Solid plan, which is part of why I bumped back the stream this morning. I just needed a little bit more sleep. Um, it's a little bit hard sometimes for me to fall asleep after streaming. But last night's court hearing started at 4 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. And I'm just, it went, it was a, what, two plus hour hearing to start with. And it was emotionally draining. So we're going to talk about that too. I'm going to give you a bit of a summary now that I've had an evening to sleep on it. I'm still not done processing yesterday's hearing. It was unexpected in quite a lot of ways, but we had some, from a internet legal commentator standpoint, some really interesting moments. From a lawyer standpoint, a lot of really frustrating moments. <laughs> so depending on what person, I'm going to give you both perspectives because like, Internet commentator Emily is like, yes. And then lawyer Emily's like, oh, I would be so frustrated. <laughs> so I'm giving you both. We're giving you both. Like, do it for the content and then, like, lawyer brain. Let's roll. You can stay up to date with everything I'm covering and fast notifications on our free iOS and Android app at lawnerdapp.com or search the app store for lawnerd. You can also follow me around social media. And don't forget to check out my podcast, The Emily Show, with quick bits dropping every Monday, summarizing everything I do here on the live streams on Tuesday and Thursday for when you just have time for the quick bits. Thanks for being a law nerd. It, yeah. Yeah, that was the that was the that was the outro. It took me that long to realize it was the outro. I'm like, wait a second. That was the wrong one. So for all of you that weren't fooled by my uh, my foolery, <laughs> Emily, live streaming is dynamic. Hey there, I'm Emily D. Baker, the internet's go-to legal analyst, breaking down the legal side of the pop culture and entertainment stories we can't stop talking about. I'm a big fan of the cursey words. I've been a licensed attorney for over 17 years, but this is not legal advice. This is where the law nerds unite to talk about facts, not <laughs> Let's get into it. Am I now considering whether we need to change the, the outro music so it's slightly different? I am. I, I am. I, I'm considering whether that would be helpful. I'm like, oh my God. Um, have, have my ADHD meds kicked in yet? Probably not. Have my, um, has my caffeine kicked in? Probably not. In my brain though, this is the thing about aging that you, I don't think you understand until you start experiencing it yourself, right? Everybody will tell you, but it's like, until you experience it, it's like, but I used to could. Like I used to, I used to be fine. I am not fine anymore. Like I used to be fine. I am no longer fine. And um, 
yeah, you can, sometimes you can see it. It's going to happen as we get into weeks and weeks and weeks of trial. You will see me getting punchy. We have some news items that we need to cover. Chad, I see you already talking about it. Don't worry, we will get there. I want to just do for everybody who didn't get to see um, yesterday's or all of yesterday's court coverage, I'm going to just do a quick summary of kind of my thoughts and takeaways. I will do this in a more formal way when we get to Quick Bits. The thing I love about the Quick Bits podcast that comes out on Monday on the Quick Bits channel and on the podcast feed is that it gives me a little time to reflect on the stories, especially when we're doing first looks and first reactions of things. It gives me a minute to be like, okay, so in the moment I was feeling this way, in hindsight, I'm thinking about it this way. Now that I've had more time to process, I see it that way. And it gives me a time to really um, uh, coalesce my thoughts and uh, take away the succinct uh, or more important bits. So you really get the succinct bits of like, this is what was important at this hearing. So you can have the TLDR of it, but we're gonna do that real quick right now. TLDR for the extensive hearing yesterday. I'm more annoyed than I was yesterday. I'm more annoyed. I'm more annoyed than I was yesterday. I'm annoyed with Judge Judge. I'm a little bit annoyed with both attorneys. I'm just, I think I'm most annoyed with Judge Judge today and I wasn't as annoyed. I was annoyed yesterday, but not as annoyed because this process is going to take so long if he continues to not just want to have a chitty chitty chat chat because i found it very charming at the beginning but i found schwartz very charming at the beginning of vanderpump rules he wants to be so involved in the process that i think it is hampering him from making decisions that he needs to make he has to make the decision and i was delighted that he seems so delighted to hear out both sides and hear out the law in some of my in some of the other hearings but in this hearing with the expert i'm like you have a hearing to listen to what this man has to say and the expert was pissed which i wanted to see his face because i was like i get it this expert is not backing down he knows his shit. he's worked in a ton of cases and he knows what he's talking about better than anyone else in the, that courtroom as it should be like as it should be but he was coming in hot probably because as we learned at the end of the hearing of the news coverage impugning his character his professionalism and um just like judge judge came in hot to the last hearing when he saw that the defense was filing that he had violated uh the defendant's well their filing stating that he had violated the defendant's due process right judge judge was pissed. Judge Judge doesn't get to be pissed. Judge Judge, you're a judge. People are going to accuse you of all kinds of shit. Like when I was a DA, oh God, Emily, back in my day, I sound like all the defense attorneys that used to come into court and be like, I used to be a DA back when I was a DA. We did blah, blah, blah. Is so-and-so still in the office? Who's your supervisor? I wonder if they were in my training class. I now hate everything that just came out of my mouth, but it was part of the job that sometimes you're the one that's the shield just getting arrows shot at you because it's the job. Your job is to navigate both the needs and justice of the case, the rights of the defendant and the victim and what has happened to them. But those things don't always align and oftentimes everyone's mad about it. Like there's times in the courtroom, the judge is pissed by what you're doing because you're like, this is what needs to be done. The defendant's pissed with what you're doing. The victim's pissed with what you're doing. And you're like, right, but this is what needs to happen in this case. And everybody's just mad. It's the same when you're a judge. Like it's the same when you're a judge. People are going to be mad at you. It's not a popularity contest with the lawyers in your court, which can be difficult when you want people to like you. I get it. We're social creatures. But as long as you get along with your colleagues, your colleagues are there for you. The lawyers in your court are not who you're seeking approval of. And there were judges who were um, uh, strict but fair that I worked with who I didn't always agree with their ruling. I didn't always agree with the things that they did. I didn't always, sometimes I was pissed at their rulings but I had a tremendous amount of respect for them because they were doing their job and they did their job in a neutral and fair way. I don't have to like what you've done 
if you're doing the thing that is under the law fair, even if I don't like the result, I'm not, as a lawyer, I'm not going to hold that against a judge. I'm going to be like, I have a tremendous amount of respect for you. Just, you know, man up and ride, Your Honor. Like, I get less mad at judges than I did at, like, water polo referees. The way I used to get pissed at them. Almost got red carded out of one of my brother's college water polo games. That's a story for a members-only live stream. But I, it it's very hard to watch him have his hands in everything and not just make the rulings because now he is delaying not just the defense but the prosecution and you could feel the frustration from all sides in the, of the court and that's because he won't just resolve it. He needs to drive the bus. You are not a passenger in this, Judge Judge. You have to drive this case forward. You have to. And so I became much more um, frustrated kind of overnight and into this morning because the delay is not being caused by anyone at this point other than him. And you have, it's hard. I get that he wants to have written rulings. It is a death penalty case. He should have written rulings. I don't know if he's ever dealt with any uh, death penalty cases and he might not have. There don't seem to be that many in the state. Um, and there aren't that many defense attorneys in the state, two or three that are death penalty qualified as public defenders. This isn't a situation that comes up a lot. And in cases that are going to take a week um, of trial, the kind of like back and forth colloquies aren't going to delay things. But in a trial that is going to be months long, he cannot micromanage what is happening. He cannot micromanage the courtroom. He has to be the referee. You don't still get to play on the field and be the ref. I love being a commentator. I don't want to be on the field. I don't want to be on the field anymore at all. At all. Don't want to be on the field. There's times that the chat is like, Emily, would you like to be a judge? I mean, in the style of Judge Judy, maybe. Like, in the style of needs to be at court at 8 a.m., works till 6 p.m., and has to make decisions all day long that are very impactful to the people in front of you? N no. No, no, I don't. I don't want to do that. I want to do this. I love doing this. This is easier than that which I will acknowledge all day long. Well, for me, I'm sure there's a lot of lawyers that are like, I want to vomit if I have to stream on the internet. Like, let me just write my thoughts out and revise them 17 times. I'm like, <laughs> I sometimes things get revised in my head as I'm saying them, which is why words come out wrong. So I am, I am more frustrated today than I was, and I am frustrated for the attorneys involved. I'm also frustrated at the attorneys involved um, because both of them, take the opportunity when the judge is like trying to have them still argue over whether or not there's going to be a hearing. Both of them still take the opportunity to, to argue. Yesterday, I kind of wished Ann Taylor had put her foot down and said, Your Honor, you said we're having a hearing. And she did this, but took the opportunity for a colloquy first. Your Honor, you said there was an opportunity for a hearing. The expert is here. Can we just start the hearing? Nothing more needs to be discussed and just put her foot down. Um, but also she's making a record, which I, she has to do. So she is making her record. And also, they're both taking the chances, the prosecution and the defense, to take shots at one another. The prosecution being like, we filed it under seal and they didn't file it under seal, so the shit's out of the horse on them, which is true. And the defense, I imagine the defense perspective on this is, well, Your Honor, the prosecution files a motion and you stop us in the middle of our work three hours later? Like, what's happening up here in Lataw County. You didn't even give us a chance to be heard. And the court's like, we're hearing you now. Four weeks later, they might get back to their surveys. So um, I'm just mirroring the frustration of everyone in that courtroom, and it's, it's gonna be a long trial. However, for those of us that enjoy court watching, the spiciness was 10 out of 10. 10 out of 10. 10 out of 10. <laughs> the, the prosecution being like, not today, judge, and the expert witness Again, not in front of a jury, taking every single inch to clap back at the prosecution was like money. He was just, and, and Bill, Santa prosecutor, is sitting there going, that's not how that works. And I'm like, G good God, Santa, you, the demeanor has been so pleasant. And he's sitting there yelling during cross-examination. I'm like, oh, the tension in this room escalated. And then, Judge, judge is smiling, going, let's just, let's all take a breath. It's like, judge, judge, 
we are not here for your amusement. I mean, I'm, I'm amused, but 10 out of 10 on spice. So that's where I'm at today after the hearing. If you want to find a spicy hearing, go watch it. Uh, let me know your thoughts in the comments. I, I, everyone was frustrated and it, it rings incredibly true. Uh, ad commit, I think this all the time. Are you not entertained? Highly, I was highly entertained. Highly entertained. I do feel bad though for the defendant, the defendant's family who, who are like, is this really what's happening in this courtroom right now? I'm sure that's speculation on my part and all of the victims' families. Because while from the internet perspective, watching court get very spicy is like, damn, court got spicy. But if you are in this community, and again, the community is being impugned, if you are family, friends, friends' families, like if, if you're related to this case, it's not going to be fun to watch the spicy. It's going to be tremendously difficult and infuriating to watch it and be like, can we not just keep moving? Like, can we not just keep moving? So, um, we have a few news topics to cover. Uh, Candy Rapper, I covered this at the beginning of stream. That date has been vacated. Corey Richens is back in court May 15th. Um, the news media keeps getting it wrong. That's why you come here. I go through the entire dockets. And if I don't, I tell you. But we have a few news items that we're going to talk about. So let's, Emily, can you get the quick bits bumper right? It's been a minute since you've rolled it. Good luck to me. Quick bits. Look at us. We made it happen. Um, I have to switch out coasters because my coaster just got stuck to the bottom of my Starbucks. But I've got the YouTube coaster does not do that. I got that at one of the creator collective events. I was like, ooh, coasters. You know, you know you've reached a certain age in life when you're like, ooh, coasters. <laughs> that's a great coaster. That's a really nice coaster. Like the whole bottom is the whole bottom of the coaster is uh is a really kind of a nice velvety material, like a really thick felt. Um, I also said that when I bought a new bird feeder. I'm I'm here, I've embraced it, I love it. We're we're glad we're we're glad we're here. News items. Um, first, we are going to talk about news reports that OJ Simpson has passed away. Uh, I saw a lot of you in the chat having the conversation about it. Uh, his family confirmed that he passed away from cancer. The only reason I bring it up is one, because I knew the chat was going to be talk about, talking about it. Two, that, um, you know, Nicole Brown Simpson and Ron Goldman died back in, what, 1994. But the trial of O.J. Simpson and the trial of like the Menendez brothers were really the beginning, it, to my memory, of the way court coverage happens today. There is a shift in the way we observe court, the way that we watch court because of this case. So it was also in my lifetime, the first memory of a case where, yes, I remember watching the Bronco Chase on TV living in LA. It brought us witnesses that had their moment in court, Cato Kalin. We, it was an extensive trial. It was a high profile murder trial. There had been a change of venue, which was probably a terrible idea for the DA's office, my former office. There was a change of venue. There was an acquittal. There was civil unrest going on in Los Angeles at the time that the trial was going on, not, which is a much broader conversation. Um, and there is a, uh, a tremendous impact to the way that we view trials because of that trial. And from my perspective, it changed the way the DA's office in LA kind of worked and dealt with high profile trials. It's also one of the first times that I remember really watching the way female attorneys were treated differently in court, the male attorneys. The media picked apart everything about Marsha Clark, and maybe I'm particularly sensitive to it as we get into cases with strong female attorneys, because, you know, if Ann Taylor yesterday had been screaming at a witness the way that um, the way that Bill, the prosecutor, was, the conversation around the broader internet, I mean, we're law nerds, not here, but around the broader internet would have focused on her being unprofessional, where with Bill, it's like, dude, are you having a day? And so I'm always mindful of that because if if she was screaming at a witness like that, I'd be like, dude, are you having a day? 
but the internet doesn't treat it that way. And watching the media tear apart, um, the one of the only female attorneys in the case was really interesting uh, to watch, especially as a high school aged, you know, I didn't think in high school I would ever go to law school. I, I wanted to. I didn't think I was smart enough. I didn't think I was capable enough. I didn't think I was, uh, that that was going to ever be an option for me. There's a meme going around right now. It's like, how did you, I don't know, I did it, it was hard. Like, how did you do this? I don't know, I did it and it's hard. And I see a lot of memes about being uh, ADHD, neurospicy, but as someone who's ADHD and dyslexic, I didn't think that was available for me. And then I was, you know, as my husband and I were dating, he's like, well, if you wanna do it, why don't you, why don't you do it? Like, just maybe try. And I was like, um, sir, my brain is very complex, but we did it. And I'm glad that I did it. But when I went to the DA's office in LA, I was very, very aware that female attorneys, their voice, their hair, their style of clothing, everything will be critiqued before they talk about their legal strategy, their arguments in court and the rest of it. And that's what, um, that's what I watched happen. And I really do think it impacted the way that I saw my career and how much I wanted to dodge and weave to stay out of the media in my career and how much I wanted to make sure that the cases I was doing were cases where I could just do my work. Like, just let me do my work. Don't talk about me. Like, you know, you just let, just let me be. Um, but it also informed the look and style of the high profile attorneys at the DA's office where there definitely was a media savviness of which attorneys would play better on TV. And that was very interesting to see as a shift within the DA's office of which attorneys are more um, TV friendly, right? Um, Java said, didn't a judge get on Emily for wearing pants rather than a skirt and heels? Uh, yes, not only a judge, but also when I worked in Congress, uh, people are like, why are you wearing pants? I'm like, because I wear pants. Thighs, honestly, is the reason. Look, man, it was 1996. I don't even think Spanx were a thing. So all of that to say, um, when I was a DA, we did a full training on the OJ Simpson case. When I worked as a law clerk at the DA's office, we worked in the archive. Yes, we worked in an archive room. When you are uh, dust sensitive is and light sensitive, I'm I'm just sometimes a little a little too special. But we worked in an archive that had no windows that had horrible overhead lighting, though we did get to um, turn off the overhead lighting and use like desk lamps, which really helped because otherwise I would have headaches all day long. But we were in an archive room with the evidence storage from the Simpson case and others. And I was like, this is a dusty and B insanity that like my worlds are colliding in this way. And then we did training from some of the OJ Simpson prosecutors talking about high profile cases, the media, talking about essentially the thought of following your own arrow when you are a trial lawyer. And it's what I, when people ask me like, what would you do in a high profile case? I would have someone else on the prosecution team monitoring social for uh, threats, for issues, for things like that, monitoring the email. And I would say that the lead trial attorneys need to put their head down and block it all out and follow their own case. If they are trying a case to what the media is saying, they are going to continue to miss the mark for the jury. You have to try your case. You just have to try your case. And it's something that the Simpson attorneys talked about quite a lot. They also talked about the role that his celebrity played in the interviewing process, in the investigative process. And that is a, a very difficult thing to navigate when you are dealing, and this was the first trial to my memory, dealing with not just a high profile murder case, but the defendant being a, a massive celebrity uh, not just locally, but internationally, but the level of local fame um, from playing football at USC and onwards impacted, in my opinion, the investigation of this case. So 
you look at all of those things and there's a lot to be learned about trying cases. There's a lot to be learned about cases with celebrity, but there's also a reminder that people are human, that humans uh, make errors, that the process is definitely not perfect. And at the end of the day, he was acquitted in the trial. He was found liable in the wrongful death lawsuits, later prosecuted for other things. And I mean, like many on his defense team, passed away at cancer, uh, passed away of uh, from cancer. So with all of that, that happened. Um, the victims of that case, Nicole Brown Simpson and Ron Goldman, I hope their families are not on social because I think there's so much distance from the trial that some um, forget what that trial was like and what it must be like for the victims' families all these years later. So all of that to say, that case kind of, I think, changed the way we view trials forever change um the way that we want openness in the courtrooms and informed lawyers about how the media could impact trials long before uh social media and the internet in this way so um do i remember when he weighed in on murdoch i absolutely remember when he weighed in on murdoch i was uh shocked by that so I've never really done a deep dive into the Simpson case, and maybe at some point there's room for that. The Kardashian connection to all of it is, was kind of wild to watch play out in their um, in their uh, reality show and in other other explorations of this case. I don't know if there's much I can add down the road, and I don't know if I ever will, but it was also weird for me growing up in Los Angeles and then watching this case like in high school because everyone had it on tv for months and then walking into like judge ito's courtroom as a da and being like this is surreal like watch walking into um what you've watched on tv is a strange thing is it just a, a strange thing um and those are things i won't forget I did not ever watch the Netflix um, the Netflix series, though I have considered it. So I I may, um, I may, but it was it, it was an interesting time. So I share all of that to say, the the trial had quite a large impact, not just on trials, on the way trials are uh, distributed, discussed, and I don't know from the Menendez brothers and trial and the oj trial and others like would we be here today if uh those trials hadn't really captured the attention the way that they did because this was like early days court tv and so would we would we be here if not for those cases i don't know what other cases have filled the void maybe they would have maybe they wouldn't have but we'll see it was a it was an interesting it was an interesting time um to live in LA through the through the riots uh the Watts riots and and others it was it was just it was an interest interesting time it's I don't know I look at the kids who are growing up through COVID and I'm like you guys are have grown up through weird times hopefully that word is now allowed back on the platform I don't even know um they live through weird times but then I look at the things that in Southern California we experienced i was in junior high when the riots happened but looking through that period of time and i think we all have those in our life where there are these touchstones of like this was going on in my community at this time and it's strange like it's strange and it impacts us moving forward so anyway that is um that is my little kind of touch in on on oj simpson passing away of cancer at 76 years old and the way that it impacted um not just the district attorney's office in LA, which is, I think the largest, or I think still the largest prosecutorial agency in the world. Um, it is a massive, massive prosecutorial body. Um, the way that it changed, like the office navigated media and television, the way that attorneys kind of took note to learn about media and television, the way that celebrity impacts investigations. There's a lot, I still think a lot to be learned um from the way celebrity impacted the police investigation in this case so and that's something that's going to continue to be navigated because again we're all humans like 
I think I'm going to get this name right. Morgan Wallen. I said Waylon. I I, I don't know why Waylon gets stuck in my head. Wallen, country singer, threw a chair off a rooftop bar in Nashville. Horribly dangerous. Um, literally, what are you doing? But do you think when law enforcement is arresting like country media stars, they're like, this is weird. Like, this is weird because they're all humans too, right? How do you put the human, unless you don't know, I think it would be very easy. It's like, do you know who I am? No. Me running into Tom Sandoval at BravoCon two years ago. No, I don't. I'm sorry. I don't. I think it's easier when you sometimes don't know. Um, but there was no one in Los Angeles at the time who didn't know who OJ was. So, um, it was always going to impact the investigation or you need to bring in like the FBI from out of state. And that would be a very interesting thing. Um, witness asked a question. I generally don't comment on my colleagues, but I will at this point. Reinhold uh, was in my training class as a DA and I found him to be absolutely excellent. I have not seen him in court uh, in years, but I have no reason to believe he's anything less than uh, still excellent, uh, but was a, a very grounded presence at our office. But we did not, we trained together, but we did not work together a ton because we lived in different areas of the county. So it's a large county and we get all divided up. All right. We've got, we've got, uh, we've got more to talk about here and I'm not going to, um, I'm not going to hold back on my love for the person that we're going to be talking about. Uh, cause it's no, it's no small statement to say that I am a jelly roll stan. I think, um, I've made that clear. I, his music blew up on YouTube. So in my mind, like Grammy nominated, like CMT smashing, iHeartRadio award winning country artist in my mind, I'm like fellow YouTuber, <laughs> fellow YouTuber, jelly roll. Um, for those of you who don't know jelly roll, uh, I did a live with Law and Lumber and covered his talk to Congress about fentanyl. It was one of the most impactful talks I have seen anyone give uh, Congress. It was absolutely in incredible. Um, has a very interesting life story. Has a very, very, very beautiful voice did the um super bowl commercial for doordash where it's like remember doordash does groceries and to remember that doordash does groceries you forget something else and jennifer aniston forgot that she knew um ross damn it why did i just blank on his name as an actor anyway rachel forgot she knew ross and he's looking in the mirror with the tattoos on his face going somebody doodled on my face <laughs> jelly roll so I will link below, uh, Mingalina, if we can find um, the link to his talk. David Schwimmer, thank you, Chad. His um, his talk to Congress. It is incredibly powerful. He started with, um, I'm a convicted felon, so I can't vote for any of you. But we need to talk about this crisis. It was just like literally like chills. Um, it ju just, uh, all, I can't stop, st I Stan, all of the Stan. I love his wife's podcast. I love them together. I love how they talk about their marriage lo like love. So let me pull this story up because it relates to P. Diddy. And I'm fascinated by that. Um, so this is coming from Billboard. Jelly Roll describes the time he almost met Diddy but bounced over a weird vibe. I don't know what it was. Sir, that is the universe having your back. That is the universe having your back. That's what that's what that is. All of this to say, and we're going to cover another story that I wasn't going to cover, but I think is important, so we're going to cover it. Um, just know that I'm still internally conflicted, but I think it's a story we need to cover, but I hate it, but we need to cover it. Listen to your gut. This is going to come up in both of the stories we're covering. Listen to your gut, internal voice. Listen to all of the things. The story came out the same day a woman sued uh, Puffy's son, Sean Combs. This came from a podcast. We'll link the podcast. Um, sometimes you just catch a weird vibe off someone and you don't know what it is. This is from Billboard. 
but you just don't want to find out. That's how Joe, that's how Jelly Roll described the time he had a chance to meet Sean Diddy Combs last October when they both men were guests on Jimmy Kimmel Live. Again, last October, his career is blowing up, but it is not blown up yet. Um, that's how Jelly Roll described the time he had a chance to meet Diddy last October when they were both guests on Jimmy Kimmel, but declined the photo op at the last minute for reasons he still can't explain. Jelly was on Kimmel. <laughs> Jelly was on Jimmy. Jelly was on Kimmel to perform on the October 30th episode that featured Diddy as a panel guest months before the series of shocking revelations emerged. I mean, uh, fair, but there are some that have been talking about this forever, at, which again, as I go back and look at, I'm like, oh, oh, there's, there's, there's been red flags for a while. Um, quote, this is the first time in my career ever where they said, do you want to meet such and such? And I said, yeah, and started walking that way. The son of a singer single said on the Cancelled with Tana Mojo podcast, I need immediately to know how many downloads the Cancelled with Tana Mojo podcast has and see if we can just pull Jelly Roll as a guest. Like, can we do that? I feel like the Emily show has quite a lot of downloads and we should be able to just make that happen. Chad. Emily, why is your law podcast all of a sudden just interviewing musicians? I don't know. They have quite a lot of insight about the world. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> he, I, I want to talk to him about his uh, YouTube career. And I said, yeah. And I started walking that way. The son of a singer, son of a sinner singer said on the canceled with Tana Mojo podcast last week after wife Bunny XO admitted that despite being a conspiracy theorist at heart, she doesn't believe in the Illuminati. Uh, the conversation went multiple directions, it seems. Asked if he's ever had a weird interaction with a fellow celeb or gotten Illuminati vibes from one. I want to know what all of that conversation was about. Jelly joked, uh, ain't nobody trying to touch my butt. Maybe I'm not their type. <laughs> Fair. The refreshingly, I, I wonder if that's a Taylor Swift reference. The refreshingly candid singer then said he did have one story. Speaking of refreshingly candid, there is an interview floating around of Jelly Roll. Again, convicted felon, has spent time in prison, has spent time in juvie, actually does a lot in Nashville to give back to the juvenile facilities. Um, because I think in juvie, hope is one of the things that absolutely needs to be a huge thing. That's a separate conversation for a separate day. But they asked him what his last meal would be. And he <laughs> they're like, what would be your last meal? And he just looks up at the interviewer with this smile on his face. And the interviewer is like, nope, nope, we can't, we can't, sir, we can't say that, sir, not that, sir, not that. And not a word, just the look on his face, dying. I was, I was dying laughing, dying laughing. He's like, last meal, dying laughing, dying laughing. Um, the refreshingly candid singer then said he did have one story about odd vibes that he would probably quote get in trouble for telling and then went ahead and tell it told it me that's me emily don't say it and for all of you that are uh tempted to drop cat emojis in the chat just go right ahead go right ahead he he is he is the pal apparently like go for for those of you that are making jokes about he wanted to eat rabbit i his wife goes by bunny on the internet chat. Um, yes, I see. I see all of you. <laughs> Quote, and as I was getting down the hallway, this is a true story. I said, he's such a good storyteller, which is why I enjoy his music. He's an incredible storyteller. I said, nah, and went to go back into the car. Jelly Roll said of the um, aborted Diddy meetup. I don't know what it was. And I made a joke at first. You don't want to, you don't want to meet the guy that got Tupac killed. I mean, I don't, where's the lie though? Where's the lie though? You don't want to meet the guy who got Tupac killed. I mean, I have to imagine that knowing the little that I do about um, the life story of Jelly Roll, that the rules of the street are not lost on him. Like you don't, he was a drug dealer for a, a fair bit before he went to prison. Um, I imagine that there's just like a, nope. 
You don't want to make the guy that got Tupac killed. And nobody thought that was funny. Um, sir, the law nerds uh, appreciate you. But um, the problem is it's a little too on the nose at the moment to be funny. <laughs> like it's, it's so on the nose that not everyone's going to laugh at that. The, the law nerds get you. Um, so Boy Max 2 said, I live in Vegas. We're going to talk about Be Vegas in a minute. Um, the rumors are that Diddy called for the hit on Tupac. Those aren't, I can't say they aren't rumors. They are rumors, but they are the, that came from Keefe D who was in the car that shot at Tupac. So the rumors are coming from a person that is one of the last living witnesses to the killing of Tupac. So when we say they aren't rumors, they are, um, well, it's what Keefe D said. Keefe D said that's what happened. So do we believe Keefe D or not, I guess is the question, but that's what Keefe D said had happened. And um, Keefe D is not the only one that has said that uh, Diddy put out the hit on Tupac and Suge Knight. But that is getting us back into um, the 90s East Coast, West Coast rap beefs. I'm sure there's someone out there that has a PhD in this. There is so much. Um, Emily, who said YouTube just yeeted me. I've been seeing that from um, from y'all quite a bit that you're having some uh, platform stability issues. So that is a known issue. Anna said the rumors are coming from inside the car. <laughs> Yep. Jelly Roll and 50 Cent need to hang out and do a podcast. Like, just let us in on the conversation. Um, and nobody thought it was funny. We, we get, we get you, Jelly. Um, when we were talking, I was like, I don't know. Very seldom does things rub me in a way where I was like, I don't even know if that's a picture I want. While the photo op didn't happen, Jelly Roll's instincts about the bad boys record mogul and one of the first hip hop billionaires now seems a uh, precedent since Combs's ex singer Cassie Ventura filed a lawsuit, amongst others. So, um, that podcast episode is linked. We'll link it too if you're curious and hearing what he has to say at the 4250 mark of that podcast. Hey, Billboard, shout out for actually time stamping it. Like, well played. Well played. I, uh, I think it's very interesting to see people more open to talking about their experiences with Diddy. This is exactly what happened with Weinstein. It takes somebody to stand up and put their foot down. In this case, it was Cassie Ventura. It takes somebody to stand up and put their foot down. And when it opens the door, that door sometimes is a floodgate. And that's what's happening with uh, Diddy. And I think we're going to continue to see it. The next case we're going to talk about is a case when I saw it break, I was absolutely horrified to see the headlines on this. Uh, this has not gained national news attention. This has gained quite a lot of attention within the legal world. It is, uh, it's heartbreaking. I was very torn about covering it, but after seeing some of the reporting that is coming out after it, I thought we needed to again talk about trusting your instincts and the fact that family law can be incredibly dangerous. I'm going to preface this by saying the reason I wanted to tell you this story and when I cover things that are challenging, I try to tell you the reason I do or do not cover them because I think it, A, it helps me process, but B, I hope it helps understand or helps you understand how I'm approaching something and why. In the Corey Richens case particularly, which we're going to talk about in a little bit, but in the, in the Corey Richens case particularly, but also in the Frankie case, there has been some discussion about why didn't you leave? Um, and why didn't you, like, why didn't this, this, this? I think asking questions is always helpful. But I also think there's context around those questions. And when we talked about the Corey Richens case, I'm sure some of you already know about what case this is. Um, when we talk about the Corey Richens case, and talk about her husband, Eric Richens, being concerned that his wife had tried to poison him on Valentine's Day. There were a lot of questions of like, but I just don't, under I don't understand why, after suspecting that your spouse is trying to poison you, why you stay. And I think truly those are genuine questions of people trying to understand. I don't think they're meant, I, I don't think, especially with the law nerds, they're ever meant 
maliciously. They're meant to be like, I just don't understand. And so I'm, I'm going to cover this news story to hopefully help bring some context and some understanding about how hard it can be when there are kids involved. And even when there aren't, when there is money that's intertwined, when safety is an issue, Cassie Ventura went to leave Tupac, not Tupac, damn it, Emily, brain. Cassie Ventura went to leave P. Diddy and is allegedly was allegedly dating Kid Cudi. And Diddy said to her, I'm going to blow up his car. And then his car did, in fact, blow up. So there are times when the instinct that leaving is going to be incredibly dangerous is a protection mechanism. And so talking about the difficulty in navigating when you think your spouse is harming you, leaving your kids there is a very complex conversation because um, in a lot of states, if a father sometimes or a mother, depending on the state, took their kids away from the spouse and left, there can be spousal kidnapping charges. Like it is a very complex, like taking your kids and going can be uh, dangerous, but it can also be legally ill-advised if you hope to have a case down the road to get divorced and get your kids. And fighting over custody of kids is very very dangerous. There were cases when I worked in the civil courthouse, um, when I was a research attorney for judges, I didn't mean for this episode to be all about me. I'm just trying to share experience for context. The only courtrooms in the building that had armed bailiffs were the family law courts because they needed them. There had been instances of people taking out their entire families so to not give up custody, these are things that are are not logical responses, obviously. Logical responses are not um, to harm people. These are, these are not logical reactions to stress. So when we get into talking about the Corey Richens case later, keeping in mind that Utah family courts are still very maternally friendly. So a father taking his children and leaving is not going to play well in the family court if they go to get divorced. And how do you leave your kids in a home where you think your spouse is trying to kill you? Like I, it's, it's a very complex and difficult situation. And I think there's room to have conversation with compassion, but keep in mind that A, none of us know what we're going to do in a situation until we're faced with it. B, um, hindsight, is always much more clear than in the moment. And C, trying to process that your spouse might be trying to kill you is going to take uh, time. Because I think he was stunned based on the text messages we've seen in the Richens case. Like, is this really happening? Like, did that, did that just happen? And that is the case in a lot of, of victims that I've worked with where when there is a pattern it takes time to go, is this like, is this, re is this happening? Like, how is this happening? And I'm sure we've all had those moments in our life where you're like, how have I, how have I done this thing? How has this thing happened? Like, I feel like I know better than this, but yet here we are. Me with my car registration every single year. Not to, you know, to bring it back to a, a, a smaller and less serious example. To say all of that, the story that we're covering comes out of Las Vegas. And just remember, when we are in fight, flight, or freeze, the logic centers of our brain literally don't work. They, and this is something that took me time to learn too. This isn't something we talk about in school. I wish we did. I wish we had more classes on like um, emotional intelligence, how our brains work, how understanding works. Because honestly, AI is going to be able to write your your paper about you know Romeo and Juliet or uh, Wuthering Heights or whatever down the road. We have access to tons of information. What we don't have access. Ja, damn it! I'm like we're soapboxing. I didn't realize that was happening. 
we have access to so much information. We're always going to be able to find information and find answers. We don't necessarily need to remember the year that the Magna Carta was signed or whatever. We need the context because in the context, we can process new information. We need to understand history so we don't repeat it. But we also need to learn like how our brains work because A, it helps people not feel so alone and B, it will help us continue to navigate the world as technology changes if we understand like how thinking works. But it's the reason reality TV shows, to bring it back to something that is way less serious than what we're gonna talk about, it is the reason reality shows like Survivor or The Amazing Race are so fascinating to watch, right? You're sitting at home, me, I'm sitting at home going, well, that puzzle looks easy to solve. I haven't been sleeping out on the ground amidst the bugs dehydrated and underfed for days and days. Like your brain isn't working the same. Putting people under faux duress or created duress, I guess it's not fake, it, the duress is real, the situation is fake. But putting people under duress makes it harder for your brain to process. Some people do that better than others. But that's where you get those moments in like reality television or competition television where you're like, why is your brain not working? <laughs> well, because of all the stress, you have just the logic centers of your brain have shut down and sitting at home. It's like, why'd you pick that flight? That doesn't seem like a, a good choice. Well, because stress, that's why. Have you ever booked a flight under stress? I have. I ended up in Charlotte instead of Charleston. Sure did. Sure did. So brains. Brains, 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 brains. They function funny, they do weird things, and when we are under stress, they do different things. Here's what I'm gonna say. Trust yourself, trust yourself. For all the comments the chat, you guys are like, I could solve this from my couch, easy. Yes, I was also an excellent parent before I had kids. <laughs> I, was like, I was like, why is that happening? Then I had kids, I'm like, oh, brains. All that to say, we're going to Vegas to talk about a shooting um, murder-suicide during a deposition. This case likens for me to the Adelson case. It is a very, very sad case. I'm going to go over it briefly to say that um, the mother of the children at the center of the custody dispute was contacting private security because she was afraid of her ex and canceled private security the day that this happened. So the relation of the parties is complex, like the Adelson case. There is a chart, and then we are going to go to the whole story. This is coming to us from 8 News Now in Las Vegas. Um, I always like going to local media first. This is an awful case. It is very like the Adelson case. So Ashley Prince and Dennis Prince were at this deposition. Ashley Prince, I'm going to refer to her as the mother of the children. This was a custody dispute deposition. Ashley Prince had been married to Dylan Houston. So Dylan and Ashley are ex-spouses and the parents. Um, for those of you who are like, I need to opt out, I'll be like five minutes and then we'll be moving on. Joe Houston is the father of Dylan Houston, the ex-father-in-law of Ashley Prince. Ashley is now married to Dennis. Dennis is a lawyer. Dylan is a lawyer. Joe is a lawyer. All lawyers. All lawyers. Dylan did not, Dylan, the father of the children, did not go to the deposition. Joe, Joe the grandfather of the children and father-in-law of Ashley were at the deposition. The father, the ex-father-in-law, grandfather, shot and killed Ashley and Dennis during the deposition and then himself. Absolutely horrific. And the reason I cover this again is to say that this was a contentious divorce case, like the Adelson case. This was a contentious child custody, custody battle. And... Ashley's instinct was, we need private security because I am concerned. And then when she learned that her ex-spouse wasn't going to be at the deposition, she said, we're going to be fine. And then her ex-father-in-law um, shot and killed her, her husband, and, the ex and himself. 
absolutely horrific. However, however is not the right connector. Absolutely horrific, period. Family law can be incredibly, incredibly dangerous. And when we talk about the Richens case, the Richens case at its heart is a family law case. The Adelson case at its heart is a family law case. I don't know how the law is going to address dealing with family law, but this is a horrifying. It is definitely shaken the legal community. I'm sure the local community in Summerlin is shaken by this. Um, because when I saw it, I was. The attorneys that I have seen harmed in connection with their work for the most part, have been in family law and probate. Not DAs, not defense attorneys, not criminal attorneys. It happens. But attorneys that I have seen harmed are in family law and probate. How long ago did this happen? It happened on Monday, Friday. It, this just, just happened. Um, just, just happened during a deposition at the law firm inside the law firm at a conference room inside the law firm um so we're going to go through the story real quick i i again i contemplated covering this or not but i think as it relates to the to the richens case you can tell i'm un uncomfortable because i'm babbling it this case is horrendously sad but as it relates to the richens case and the other family law cases that we talk about the the context in this is that family law is incredibly contentious incredibly dangerous and you're dealing with people who are not logicking the approach right uh this is coming from las vegas text messages and an e an email and surveillance report reviewed by the eight news now investigators reveal more about the bitter custody battle that resulted in a deadly shooting inside a las vegas law firm Joe Houston, 77, shot and killed Ashley Price, 30, and her husband, Dennis Price, 57, during a custody deposition at Dennis Prince's, sorry, I said Price, Prince's law firm on Monday. Uh, and from everything I've seen, Dennis was tremendously well-respected within the legal community um, in Vegas and, and wider. So Joe Houston was there to represent his son, Dylan Houston, in the custody dispute with his former wife, Ashley Prince, Dennis Prince was representing his wife, or Dil Dennis Prince was representing his wife. Several other people were in the room, including two other lawyers and a court reporter. Dylan and Ashley have two young children at the center of the custody dispute. Those young children, by the way, by the judge, have been placed with her, the mother's, the maternal sibling. Five days before the shooting, Dylan, who is an attorney, it will be interesting to see where this all goes from here. Emailed Dennis saying, quote, you have no idea what's coming. Um, do you? All your cards are on the table and I haven't played one laughing emoji. Taunting the other side in a custody battle is less than ideal. Does it happen? Yep. Is it going to get you very far? Nope. You have no idea what's coming, do you? All your cards are on the table and I haven't played one laughing emoji. The email was sent at 1.28 a.m. on April 4th. Also, um, no good's gonna come from emailing at that time of day and it's going, to, uh, it's going to appear a bit unhinged if you are emailing in the wee hours of the morning. Dylan Houston appeared to refer to a surveillance report which did not cast him in a positive light, according to a source with knowledge of the custody case. Quote, all you have is this, you need extra time for it, which is kind of shade, like you don't have a case. Dylan emailed, divorce records obtained by 8 News Now show claims made against Dylan, the paternal father, stating he tested positive for cocaine and alcohol while he had custody of their children. The records also claim that he would send abusive texts to Ashley. Dylan was observed excessively drinking on March 29th, according to a report from uh, D. Becker Investigations. This is not an uncommon part of family law. The report noted that Houston had five drinks and three shots, each over 
uh, with three shots each. Five drinks with three shots. Oh, sorry, I was reading that wrong. Five drinks. Each drink was comprised of three shots per drink. So, so you guys can math. Um, over approximately four hours, despite another individual attempting to get him not to drive, he got behind the wheel and swerved on the road, according to the report, because he was being followed due to the custody battle. Uh, Houston was required to take breathalyzer tests before spending time with his children, according to a previous court document. So this is a, this is an on, it seems like an ongoing issue in the custody battle. The court battle also included a protective order against Dylan, meaning restraining him, which was extended. Ashley, uh, Ashley Prince expressed safety concerns before Monday's child custody deposition. Again. She was right. Do you have any private security you recommend? She texted private, private investigator Hal D. Becker. Dylan has a ton of guns in that house. In another text, she wrote, I don't know if Dylan will be there, but in case he is. She was asking for security because she was afraid of her ex based on her experience. On the Thursday before the shooting, she canceled the security. Quote, nothing Monday. He will not be there. While it appeared Ashley was concerned about her ex-husband, his father, Joe Houston, turned out to be the danger. I'm sh police are still investigating. On the afternoon of the deadly shooting, a Las Vegas judge ordered that Ashley's sister should be temporarily awarded custody of the two children rather than their father, Dylan. Clark County District Court judge referred to the shooting and surveillance report, quote, placing the minor party's children with the plaintiff would be detrimental to the children and the award of custody to a non-parent is required to serve the children's best interest based upon the recent acts of plaintiff's father and plaintiff. I don't know if that's referring to the report, the drinking, the testing positive for cocaine, or if that's referring to something else. I don't know, but the court, I think, took the right action immediately. <sighs> The princes recently had a child together, meaning Ashley, the the mother of the children in the custody battle and her new husband. Um, Dennis frequently appeared on 8 News Now where he discussed civil cases. Quote, our family is in a state of profound shock and sadness at yesterday's events. I don't even know how a spokesperson says anything. It's awful. We ask for prayers and privacy as we try to navigate the coming days. Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department is still conducting their investigation. And as that continues, speculations about details of the incident only serves to add trauma to our already grieving and overwhelmed families, I mean, and their entire community. We have full faith in Metro's efforts and will leave all future communication to them in their investigations. And then the law firm made a statement as well, um, asking for privacy. This happened at the law firm. Again, I bring it up because when we look at what's going on in the Adelson case, we look at what's going on in the Richens cases, a lot of these cases are over custody of the children, who's going to have custody of the children, and contentious divorces. Uh, victim Ashley Prince's instincts were that her ex was a danger to her, and when he wasn't there, thought that that would be okay. I wonder what the police investigation will turn up. I don't normally cover things that haven't had an arrest yet, but I wonder what um, I wonder what will turn up. Uh, I don't think I made this clear. Jesse Rara in the chat. I don't think I made this clear. So her husband's family owned the law firm. He was the name partner, and her ex father in law was her husband's her ex husband's lawyer. Was her husband representing her? Yes. So Ashley Prince was being represented by her husband and her ex-husband was being represented by her ex-father-in-law. Her ex-husband is also a lawyer. Lots of, lots of lawyers involved in the case, but the ex-husband shouldn't have been emailing the new husband who's also the lawyer on the case. There's lots of interconnectedness there, like the Adelson case. So I don't know how this will shift how law firms operate how somebody was able to bring a gun and a deposition into an office is probably because the office didn't have security and 
um i imagine they didn't in they they weren't the law firm wasn't like even thinking that this was a possibility unfortunately i think we live in a time where it um it needs to be considered as a possibility sadly so it just it just makes me incredibly sad so we will see what happens from here we will see what happens with a police investigation i am going to keep an eye on it i don't know if there's anything there did the lawyer father-in-law just decide that this is what he was going to do maybe was the son involved i don't know the adelson case took quite a while to unload uh to unwind so i don't expect answers on this soon but i think whenever the investigation is completed we will hear what happens and i will be keeping an eye on it um so with that it is it, it it's just uh shocking but and also not but also and also a reminder as we cover cases like richens how um far people can stray from how you think they're going to act <sighs> how far beyond the bounds of of civilized society i think that is when we're talking about intentional infliction of emotional distress horrible stuff very sad we are going to talk about the richens case and then we are going to go to the gutierrez uh sentencing um i have i have only seen some reports of this coffee for one but i have seen reports that the father-in-law had terminal cancer all right um Miguelina, yeah go ahead and send an app notification that we're moving on for those that were like i am out on this it is way too much i get it so i i don't not all law firms have security a lot don't like a lot don't have security so i i don't think so like i don't think so just just it's just awful absolutely awful um i don't need to further express to you the awful i don't have other words for that it, again we we need to work on brains people are not okay this is not this is not good for these kids this is not a a it, this this is this is just this is not an option but i i just my heart breaks for these kids just absolutely breaks absolutely breaks for the these kids um even if there was security would they have scrutinized another lawyer probably not um they i it's an office building i don't know if they courthouses have metal detectors um i don't know if office buildings do but courthouses have metal detectors <sighs> so with that i think um I, I think law firms will be having a lot of discussions about uh where you go from here mediation firms and the rest of it especially when you're dealing with cases that are contentious i'm really hoping that even though we're dealing with a case that is contentious there is uh some illuminating information in the corey richens case so we can so we can just move on to something else which is what i'm going to do um as i am pulling that up though we're gonna we're gonna take a mo i'm gonna swoop we're gonna we're gonna swoop but we're gonna pull we're gonna pull up um a palate cleanser not a palate cleanser of ryan hall y'all i love ryan hall y'all but um weather can be stressful so um we're pulling up cornell real quick to the cornell to the bird camera emily where are we going to the bird wait these are not birds should start coming up here any moment what what is that the, it it, it what happened to the birds? The bird. Well, hello everyone. Sir, the birds are. Um, we're going live here just a minute or so early because of all the things you can never figure out when the... you're connecting bits of the but... internet across the world. The birds. Um, <laughs> my name's Charles Eldermeyer. Charles. I'm today with Rebecca. Rebecca. Geez, I'm sorry, Becca. I always want to say this because your last name, Becca Radonsky Bish. Wait, your last name is Bish? Oh, uh, I'm obsessed. And Leah Buffon. And we're all from the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. Um, we're about to hop into some bird watching. 
And I want to welcome everybody. To this the is audience. live. Today, you're going to learn who we are. <laughs> you're going to learn about some birds. We're going to watch them. Wait, can together we together real time? I, I, I really want to do bird watching with the ornithologists, the bird feeder watch party. I'm going to come back to like, I'm going to come back to the bird feeder watch party with Becca Bish. Like I'm, I'm here for all of it, but I was really just trying to get to one of the live cameras. I I'm delighted, but we can't, Emily, we don't, we can't today. We can't today. Um, I really like this particular one. This was, this was meant to be the palate cleanser, but the way I want to run down the rabbit hole of, uh, Becca Bish and the birds is, is just unhinged. Yes, we can link the channel. It's the Cornell Labs channel. I like the sapsucker woods bird feeders because they are out, 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 and you get the water is, um, also quite active with wildlife. I love it. I love it. So, okay. We can't watch. We can't have a watch party. I love a watch party. We can't have a watch party. We have to go to Corey Richens. Let me, I'm going to leave the birds here while we grab the, while I grab the documents. Oh, wait, wait, when I, sw when I switch screens, it pauses. Well, that's not helpful. That's not helpful. The, the, you know, we, we had a cardinal for a minute. Um, I love it though. These are real time live feeds. So if you watch them throughout the day, you will see the peanuts, the peanuts, uh, disappear throughout the day. Just, hey, it's a red, it's a, it, it was a red bellied woodpecker. I have to stop. I'm now embarrassing myself. Um, so yes, from bird feeders to the walk, the dog letter to the, the fact that the channel actually does have a, uh, bird feeder watch party. Like I want to, I want to bird watch with the ornithologists. So I'm sorry to have to, uh, to have to end our bird watching. We will, we will do bird watching together another day and I'll be like, Oh, <laughs> woodpeckers, blue jays, cardinals. Um, but we need to go to the state's motion to pre-admit evidence, even though um, the bird feeder cams are like my happy place. <laughs> Destiny Salinger said, get in the car, Elizabeth. We're watching birds with Becca Bish. I want to go watch birds with Becca Bish too. Um, get in the car, Elizabeth. That story is on the members only from last night. My teen is, my teen is a delight. I, I love, I love having a teen. Um, but there are moments of having a teen that are, um, that are humbling. Um, that, that just remind, that just remind you that, uh, that you, you are as a parent, you are going to have moments where you're like, well, that didn't, that didn't go as planned. Um, so that didn't go as planned at all. Um, Lauren is asking me about controversy I know nothing about. What's your stance on the controversy between the two guys who were apparently both the first to see 10,000 unique birds? Um, they need to have a gym battle in Pallet Town to determine who is the greatest trainer of all times. That's the, on that's the only, the only option is that they, they need to have a Pokemon battle. I mean... They want to be the very best, the best there ever was. Dun, dun, dun. Okay. W Corey Richens, I'm swooping again. Emily, what has happened today? We were up late last night. All right. Corey Richens, this is the state's motion to pre-admit exhibitees for the preliminary hearing. For those of you that are newer to the channel, by the way, thank you. We did hit 750,000 subscribers. Uh, um, go ahead and, uh, and hit the subscribe button. Exhibities came from the DA's delightful, uh, miss misstatement during the Brooks case, wherein she said, your honor, we have the exhibities. And I was like, exhibities, exhibities, exhibities. Um, yeah, I, I need to take voice lessons before we continue streaming so that I can like not embarrass myself. 
Oh, Miguelina reminded me that we needed a road so far. Thank you, Miguelina. This is why I have a producer to produce my ADHD. Okay. Corey Richens, who some of you may not remember by name, but you might remember by the facts of this case. She is accused of uh, poisoning her husband with a massive amount of fentanyl, presumably in a Moscow mule. Since then, since the beginning of the case, we have now learned not only that she had written a children's book about grief and was on tour for that children's book um, or local media for that children's book when she was arrested for the alleged murder of her husband. This is a, another case out of Utah. She also um, wrote a letter slash novel that was titled Walk the Dog. The prosecution insinuated to the court that they were pursuing and or looking at potential witness tampering charges and that they wanted a no contact order between Corey Richens and her mother and potentially her brother to the best of memory because of the Walk the Dog letter. We covered the Walk the Dog letter and I was like, we are here for every turn of this case. The detention hearing was full of information with regard to a fight she got into her sister-in-law or into with her sister-in-law shortly after her husband's death. And from there, the intertwined nature of this case and the things that are similar to the Murdoch case became much more clear. There is a lot of financial, potential financial motive here. There is um, allegations of, of debt and moving around money. It seems that the victim in this case, Eric Richens, changed how his wife would um, receive his estate in the event of his death and that she did not know that at the time of his death. Since then, it has come out that police have investigated her mother, a probable cause affidavit, not a, yes, it was a probable cause affidavit for a search warrant was released or unsealed that showed that law enforcement was looking to search the mother's digital uh, devices as well to see if the mother um, was involved in the conspiracy to commit murder and related that back to the mother's um, partner of not an extensive period uh, passing away in an unexpected um, and sudden way from an overdose and that the partner had recently changed Corey Richens' mother to be the beneficiary of her estate. So law enforcement was like, this is odd. So that all came forward. Then prosecution dropped a, a just a stack of more charges against Corey Richens. So not only is she facing murder charges, she is also facing attempted murder charges for the alleged attempted murder of her husband on Valentine's Day. They released a whole bunch of text messages between Corey Richens and as the prosecution calls it, a paramour. So it seems that prosecute. Prosecutors have indicated that Corey was having an affair outside of her marriage. We have the walk the dog letter that tells her mom that we need a story um, about whether Eric was picking up fentanyl in Mexico. We have a bunch of financial crimes now, including mortgage fraud, fraud, and other crimes where she was, um, she is alleged to have been presenting false documents to the bank to take out more loans. She was incredibly in debt with houses that she was flipping for her real estate business and her husband's business was thriving. She also was well aware that the only way she would take any part of her husband's estate is if he died while they were married per their prenuptial agreement. And in that context, we have this motion to pre-admit exhibits for the preliminary hearing that is next week. The bail hearing, if you want kind of all the overview on this case, the bail hearing is where to go. For those asking what the walk the dog letter is, I covered it. I think we have a playlist on this. I covered it. It is a letter that was recovered from her jail cell. The top of the letter said walk the dog and then listed out a, depending on your perspective, a story that was either fictional or what she wanted witnesses to say. It seemed to indicate that she wanted her 
brother to tell her defense attorney like a get on board story. Other, other parts of the novel have since been disclosed to prosecution per other court documents. I'm very interested to see what those are and let's see if they're here. This is a first look. We also covered, I read it all in my Valley Girl voice. We also covered Corey Richens' phone call with her brother where she was like, they just don't even understand. It was in the Walk the Dog letter, I believe, that she was trying to get crest strips snuck into the jail. So there's also a level of like, I saw myself on TV, but like, ew, my teeth, which is interesting when you're facing a murder prosecution, I think. It's just an interesting detail to focus on, isn't it? So let's see what the prosecution would like to bring forward. There's going to be a road so far in this too. So Miguelina, if this road so far is better, we'll just do this one. We're going to swoop again. Emily, how many swoops does it take to get to the actual story? More licks than it takes to get to the center of a Tootsie Pop um, at this point. Emily, are we ever going to move on from here? I don't, I don't know how this morning took as long as it did so far. I don't know. Yes, we are. State's motion to pre-admit exhibits. So the state hereby moves under lots of sections of the evidence code to pre-admit evidence for the purpose of preliminary hearing. Your Honor, can we fight about it now? Can we just talk about it now so we don't have to do this? The prelim is going to be like a week. Can we just do it now? The prelim is going to come right in the middle of the Karen Reed case. I don't know what I'm going to do. We're going to figure it out. Uh, the proposed exhibits are available to the defense in a shared discovery file. The state will deliver them to the court on the thumb drive when it files a requested submission, a request to submit for decision. The request to submit for decision is when the briefing is done. The prosecution has made their motion. The defense gets to respond and then the prosecution replies and then they ask for a decision, which is why this is starting a little bit more than a month before the prelim. The timestamps on some of the exhibits are depicted in coordinated universal time mountain standard time is seven hours behind utc daylight time six hours the state will provide the court and defense exhibits normalized to the appropriate mountain time hey that's super helpful the state is cognizant of the fast approaching preliminary hearing date accordingly it will truncate its reply briefing deadline and quickly file a request to submit for decision ideally this will allow the court an opportunity to rule on this motion well in advance of preliminary hearing i've not seen this done um, I've not seen this done this way, but th it feels almost like prelim motions in limine, which is great. On April 5th, the state asked the defense whether it should stip whether it would stipulate to the admission of any proposed exhibits. The defense has not responded at the time of this filing. So the defense is left leaving the prosecution unread and they're like, we just need a decision. On June 12th, the court held a detention hearing in this matter. God, was that 2023? Is that almost a year ago? It was fascinating. If you haven't watched it, I'll make sure we have a playlist. Um, each testified under oath and were subject to cross-examination. The defense cross-examined each witness. It's cross-examination of Detective O'Driscoll. Uh, the lead detective in the case was longer than the state's direct examination of him. Yeah, and at the time, defense possessed all the discovery material underlying each witness testimony. At 3.21 a.m., Excuse me. At 3.21 a.m. March 4th, the defendant called Summit County Dispatch, reported that her husband, Eric Richens, was, quote, unquote, not breathing. He's cold. He doesn't have a pulse. In accordance with policy and regularly conducted activity, Summit County Dispatch recorded that phone call. Yeah, 911 calls are recorded. Approximately 10 minutes later, Summit County Sheriff's Deputy Vincent Wynn arrived at Eric Richens' home in accordance with policy and regularly conducted activity. I'm going to start cutting that part of the sentence out. Detective Wynn recorded the events uh, that followed on his body cam. This is kind of laying business records foundation. Like this is this is occurring in the regular course of business. These are business records. But I'm going to start truncating that out of this motion. A pathologist at the OME's office performed an autopsy on Richens and concluded his immediate cause of death was drug intoxication fentanyl. In accordance with policy, the OME prepared a report of its autopsy findings. On April 14th, Detectives O'Driscoll and Hoffmeyer interviewed the defendant, the defendant at Eric Richens' home. Note that they're saying at Eric Richens' home because the marital home was in Eric Richens' name. He purchased that home before 
the marriage. So that home was in fact his. So the home became Eric's sisters when Eric passed, which Corey did not know about. We learned about that in the last filing when I covered this case with the new probable cause affidavit and the new charges. In accordance with Paul, mm, Emily, you said you were gonna stop. The uh, interview was recorded. As a part of the investigations, detectives seized Richen's cell phone pursuant to a warrant. When was this? April 14th, 2023. The death was March 4th, 2022. So a year later is when they seized the phone. Um, forensic examination of the phone pursuant to a second warrant recovered a series of text messages exchanged between defendant and victim on February 14th regarding Eric Richens feeling ill. This was in the last filing. He also told his friends he thought his wife was trying to poison him or trying to kill him, um, which exact word he used, I don't remember accurately. As the defendant's paramour, can we just say lover? Why are we? Uh, okay. The, I'll ask somebody about this choice later. The defendant's paramour consented to the seizure and search of his cell phone. Law enforcement also obtained a warrant. Can you imagine? It's like, Hey, sir. So, um, the woman you were having an affair with is under investigation for the murder of her husband. And what we're going to need is your phone. So we're going to want to go ahead and search that and maybe have a, uh, a, a think on, on where we want to go from here. So anyway, the Paramore's phone was searched and seized. D do you think the Paramore got a lawyer to like limit the search? Like what else is in that phone? Okay. Either way, search and seizure of the phone. And it's like, and by the way, maybe we, maybe we have a com maybe we have a conversation about that. Law enforcement also obtained warrants to seize and search his cell phone, even though he had given consent. Well done, law enforcement. Uh, formalities are very helpful as you get into uh, murder prosecutions. Uh, let's see. Forensic examination of the phone recovered a series of text messages between defendant and Paramore on February 14th, 2022, regarding meeting in person. Yes, there was allegedly a poison sandwich. Eric, the victim, fell ill, and the defendant was meeting up with her Paramore. Um, Plexus Val in the chat said, who would want to date a murderer? Two thoughts on that. First, um, Corey Richens has not been convicted and still is presumed innocent but I think it would raise an eyebrow. Second, um, people in custody seem to have uh, uh, vibrant dating lives, and um, there seem to be uh, a portion of the population that uh, is enthralled by uh, those who commit crime. Um, people get married while they're in custody, including Jorn Vandersloot had a child while he, well, he didn't, have a child, but he fathered a child while he was in custody. Like there's a whole group of people that think Brian Koberger is like the hottest thing to walk on two legs into a courtroom. So I, yeah, I, uh, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Um, let's see. Forensic examination of the phone pursuant to a second warrant recovered a series of messages between the defendant and her best friend on June 18th regarding allegations in a civil suit that the defendant attempted to murder Eric Richens on February 14th. I want to know that. What were you talking to your bestie about? What, what were you texting your bestie about? On August 22nd, defendant spoke with her mother and brother over phone from the Summit County Jail. This is after the arrest. Regarding allegations in a civil suit that the defendant attempted to murder Eric Richens on February 14th, in accordance with policy, it was recorded. Jail calls are recorded. In response to subpoena, Finan Ironbridge Financial uh, provided documents regarding Kay Richens Realty. 
submitted in support of a loan application, including a falsified America First Credit Union statement for K. Richens Realty dated May 31st, 2021. In response to subpoena, America First um, provided account statements for that company and for the victim's company, CNE Stone Masonry, each dated May 31st. Remember, she was using her husband's business's bank statements and forged them to make them look like her business bank statements, according to the last filing by the prosecution. In response, Boomerang Financial submitted documents with regard to K. Richens Realty, including what the prosecution says as a falsified American first statement for the business dated June 30th, 2021. Mm, this is all the additional documents and insurance documents we saw in the last um, in the last filing with the extended charges. Brain. Legal authority. Utah Criminal Rule 12C provides in part any defense objection or request, including requests for rulings on the admissibility of evidence, which is capable of determination without the trial of a general issue may be raised prior to trial. I mean, this isn't trial. This is prelim, but I, I imagine the court would want to save the time. These are basically preliminary hearing motions in limine. It doesn't normally come up. Like normally you have everybody sitting there and you do this then. But uh, I think this is a more expedited way to do it, especially since this is a time-consuming and high-profile case. Utah Rule of Evidence 104A provides, in pertinent part, Quote, the court may decide any preliminary question about whether a witness is qualified, a privilege exists, or evidence is admissible. In so deciding, the court is not bound by the evidence rules, except those on privilege. Um, that's going to go partly to preliminary hearing. Uh, they talk about hearsay at preliminary hearing. Hearsay is permissible at preliminary hearing, as long as the person is so qualified to give hearsay testimony. And then they're going through uh, evidence rule 803. The following are not excluded by the range, by the rule against hearsay, regardless of whether the declarant is available. Present sense impression, excited utterance. These are going to come up as a way to get the victim's statements to others in to testimony. Present sense impression, a statement describing or explaining an event or condition made well or immediately after the declarant perceived it. The text from the victim that we saw in the last probable cause filing with regard to the stacks of new charges was, I like, I almost died. My wife tried to kill me. Um, excited utterance, a statement relating to a startling event or condition made while the declarant was under the stress of excitement that it caused. Statement made for medical diagnosis or treatment. Did Eric Richens seek medical treatment for the condition um, after eating the sandwich that was uh, suspectedly laced because there were other text messages that we saw that after the Valentine's Day incident that is now charged as an attempted murder, that Corey Richens reached back out to the person who provided her the fentanyl and asked for stronger fentanyl. Records of regularly conducted activity. These are business records exception. Uh, rule of evidence 804. Exceptions. The following are not excluded by the rule against hearsay. Former testimony. Testimony that was given as a witness at a trial hearing or lawful deposition. Statements against interest. Those are statements of the other party. Uh, 1101 evidence. Preliminary questions of fact. The determination of questions of fact. Preliminary to the admissibility of evidence when the issue is to be determined by the court under URE 404, reliable hearsay and criminal investigations or preliminary examinations, rather, under uh, 1101 and then 1102. We're not going to go through all the rest of the rules of hearsay. Um, here's the rule. At, at the detention hearing, the state had the burden to show that there was a substantial evidence to support the aggravated murder charge. In determining whether substantial evidence existed, the court's required to evaluate the strength of the evidence presented. This is the preliminary standard. This is the more like more likely than not, the probable cause standard. That's not in controversy. Let's get to the evidence. Uh, Lupe, 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 thank you. Um, hello, Emily from Dubai. I've learned so much from you. My husband is obsessed with fact, not fuckery. Fantastic. Uh, love Dubai. I love 
I love the Real Housewives from Dubai. They are delight. They are delightful. Um, Caroline Sansbury and Chanel Ion are just just entertaining. When Real Housewives of Dubai comes back, I think it's going to be a banger of a season. But we were at BravoCon, and I know BravoCon has been pushed to 2025, like November 2025. Sad. But Chanel was talking about how much she loved being in the U.S. She's like, I can fucking say whatever the fuck I want to. It's fucking great. I was like, Chanel, you're amazing. Just, just so, just such an incredible sense of humor. All right, basis for admission. States Exhibit 1. We're going to go through each of these exhibits to find out what the exhibits are. Uh, and we've only got six more pages of it going to be great. States Exhibit 1 is a certified transcript of the detention hearing, the detention hearing testimony of the uh, detective. The uh, other witnesses is admissible, they say, under 1102B2, former testimony. Each witness gave testimony at the hearing in the current proceeding, and the defense had an opportunity and similar motive to develop the testimony by cross-examination. The defense diligently exercised its opportunity to cross-examine. So, like, the defense isn't going to be deprived of anything if that testimony is admitted here, is, is their argument. A portion of Detective O'Driscoll's testimony includes statements by certain drug dealers and others involved in the defendant purchasing fentanyl. Uh, this testimony requires a hearsay within hearsay analysis. The, statement of the, the statements of those involved with the defendant purchasing fentanyl are admissible under 1102B2. Uh, which references Utah Rule of Evidence 804, because they are statements against interest in each instance. So when we're talking about double hearsay, we're talking, you've got to go like layer by layer. So the first layer of hearsay is going to be, the first layer of hearsay is the detective telling the court. So what's the exception that the detective can tell the court? And then it's, what's the rule for the person telling the detective? So somebody told detective, detective told court. So they're they're pulling back um, the layers there because now you have prior testimony. I don't know why the detective wouldn't just come in and testify about it again. Or, oh no, the detective is, no, the detective is testifying. I'm going to reverse myself. The detective is testifying to what others learned from them. So detective to other officer, other officer to the drug dealers. So drug dealers, officer, officer, detective. Those are the two levels of hearsay, which um, shouldn't be hard to overcome for preliminary hearing, honestly, because they've already had those cross-examinations. Um, but we'll see. Uh, a portion of Detective O'Driscoll's testimony includes statements by other law enforcement officers. Emily, you should have just kept reading. <laughs> the testimony requires hearsay within hearsay. Statements by other law enforcement officers are admissible under 1102B6 because they're statements of non-testifying peace officers to the detective who is testifying. Accordingly, all testimony contained in the transcript of the hearing is admissible. States Exhibit 2 is a certified transcript of the 911 call. 911 calls are admissible. I'm not going through the analysis. 911 calls are admissible. Um, there's very limited circumstances where they're not. States Exhibit 3 is going to be the body-worn camera video from the night of Eric Richen's death. There's going to be a business records exception to that. The statement on the statements on the video are made by either the defendant, first responders, or family members. The defendant's statements are not hearsay because they're statements of a party opponent. Most of the statements by first responders and family members are not hearsay because the state is not offering them offering them for the truth of the matter. Rather, the state is offering them for their effect on the hearer, the defendant. So, how is the defendant responding to the things that are being said to her in this circumstance? What is her behavior and demeanor? States Exhibit 4, the OME report, the OME supplemental report, and the autopsy reports. States Exhibit 5 is a certified copy of law enforcement's April 14th, 2023 interview with defendant. The statements are made by either defendant detectives or defendant's mother. Was defendant's mother present? The defendant's statement are not hearsay. They're statements of a party opponent. The detectives and defendant's mother are not hearsay because the state's not offering them for the truth. The state is offering them for the effect on the hearer, the defendant. Again, why is the defendant doing, saying, or responding the way that she is? Six through eight are the text message exchanges between defendant and paramour and defendant and bestie. 
Most of the statements of those she was texting are not hearsay under 801. State's not offers, offering them for the truth. State is offering them for effect on the hearer of the defendant. So the state's saying, we're not saying that what the paramour said to Corey Richens is true or not. We're saying it to give context to how she's responding. This is, they could also uh, argue completeness, but that's what they're arguing. Certified transcript to telephone calls between defendant and mother and defendant and brother. Uh, defendants are state defendant statements are statements of a party opponent. Most of mother and brother's statements are not hearsay because the state's not offering them for the truth. To the extent the state offers any of defendants, mothers or brothers statements for the truth, they're admissible um, under 1102B1 because they are present sense impressions. So, hey, there's a few things in here that are responding to what's happening. Uh, 11 exhibits 11 and 14 are the falsified bank records exhibits 12 13 15 and 16 are bank account records 17 is the life insurance policy application for the husband mm -hmm. there were multiple i did tell my husband the other day husband was doing something uh ill-advised in the yard with a tree branch and uh i went outside the wood chipper was out there i went we live on well more space than we had in california my husband acts sometimes as if he doesn't watch my content dr b i know you don't watch my content sometimes dr b acts as if we live on a a large farm and i think maybe one day he wants to so the wood chipper's out there the branch is out there and he's out there by himself and i'm like could you at least call the teen to help but he's trying to take this branch down that was sus the branch was sus and i'm looking at him and i'm like um i don't know if this is a great idea but if you are going to continue doing this stuff in the yard i'm going to need you to let me know so i can increase your life insurance because the way that we're approaching this seems ill-advised to me but what do i know i'm like sir can we can we not like with the dangly branches but there are times i'm looking at him going you are one of the smartest humans i know what are you doing um taylor we are in the woods enough that power lines are not even in that area literally at all and delightedly or delightfully um in our neighborhood everything's undergrounded so power lines weren't an issue but um sussy branches were definitely an issue and i was like can you can you just can you just if you are going to do that can you give me a heads up because um i i need to take out another life insurance policy if you're going to do this i'm just and this is a man who has a history of of doing things in a way where he ends up injured and then he's like how did i hurt myself and i'm like how did you not foresee that better than again this is a man who has given himself multiple concussions in his teen years um from being like no i've got this <laughs> so sure <laughs> but i regularly make jokes about life insurance policies um reg regularly make jokes about like i need i need more life insurance on if you're if you're going to do that if you're going to do that we just um we we assess risk very differently he and i <laughs> my dad does this too um where i'm like D dad i i realize that in your brain like you're somewhere in your 50s but in uh the the timeline of linear time on this planet your earthly age is not that so could you please get off of the very extended ladder to the very tall second story and let someone else do the Christmas lights for the love of my stress levels. Either way, I digressed, we'll be back. Celestial said, ah, the it'll be fine, Gene. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's times I do that too. When I look at like how much gas I have in the car, how charged it is, I'm like, it'll be fine. It'll be fine. Or how much time I have to get to the airport, it'll be fine. But not when it comes to like, ladders and sharp objects and tree branches it's normally with regard to time and distance it'll be fine 
Stakes Exhibit 18 contains True Stages notes regarding defendant's insurance claim. They say it's admissible uh, because it is business records. In sum, each of the state's exhibits are admissible at this preliminary hearing as not hearsay, which is the proper way to phrase it, legally speaking, or reliable hearsay. So they're like, hey, this is, if it's hearsay, it has an exception, or it's not hearsay. But those are the exhibits that the state is seeking um, to submit to admit brain to admit at the preliminary hearing detention hearing transcript 911 call body cam the medical examiner's supplemental report the interview of the defendant text messages between defendant and victim text messages between defendant and paramour text messages between defendant and bestie phone call between defendant and mom phone call between defendant and brother um purported bank statement from K. Richens Realty, actual bank statement, fake forge, actual actual bank statement for K. Richens Realty, victims company's bank statement, purported um, K. Richens Realty bank statement, actual K. Richens Realty bank statement, victims uh, company bank statement, life insurance application, life insurance claim notes. With all of that, Emily, were you supposed to stop streaming at two? Yes. Are we gonna are we gonna push it a little bit further? Yes, because I have one more thing I want to cover, and I'm I'm sure it is going to be fine. Because time. It's gonna be fine. We're gonna go to the um where are we going? Chat, we're going to New Mexico. Emily, how is streaming when you're tired? It's a delightful adventure for everyone involved. Um, we're going to New Mexico real quick. Pack your bags, grab grab a drink and some snackies. Let me know what you're drinking. When you are hopping on EDB Air, everything's available. Let me know what you're drinking. I think for this flight, if I weren't drinking coffee, I would probably choose a glass of Vouv with a little splash of St. Germain. <laughs> Defendant Hannah Gutierrez-Reed has submitted her sentencing memorandum through her attorney. Remember, she is being sentenced on Monday, this coming Monday. I will be streaming the sentencing on Monday, which is going to mean that we are not doing a behind-the-scenes podcast recording on Monday. I will keep you um, in, the, in the loop for what we are doing um for the behind the scenes in the app and in your member spaces so if you are um if you do not have the app yet now is the time to get the laundered app in your um app store laundered or what have you we are going to cover right now hannah's sentencing memo i was trying to look at the date or the time i think it is at 10 a.m either way I will keep you posted. She will be sentenced on Monday. Laundered app will keep you in the loop. You'll never miss a stream. You'll be here for the stuff you want to see, and you can bounce for the stuff you would like to skip over and then come back. It's perfect. I love it. I love the app. You get to choose what works for you. All right, this is coming from the court. This was filed yesterday at 2.49 p.m. I have not seen the state's response. I guarantee you the state's response is going to come out on Friday. Um, I'll probably do a quick bit on it. I don't think I will stream on Friday. I can't stream on Friday. Emily, you're not going to have power at your house on Friday. I will let you know in the app what happens when the state files theirs. How about that? Defendant Hannah Gutierrez reads sentencing memorandum and request for conditional discharge. Interesting. Interesting. Um, For those of you saying you keep uh getting kicked out of youtube it seems like the youtube mobile is is an issue um Nishé, me too edb airlines are the only flights where i don't get motion sick same 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 so um 
I don't know what I was going to say on that, but same. So I will keep you in posted on the loop when the prosecution um, files their response. This is a 23 page motion. This is a first look. We are going to try to zoom, zoom. I've got the half an hour. We are going to move. If I do not get to um, super chats and questions, I apologize. I'm going to go as quickly as I can through this so that we have it all. Here's the quick background. A jury convicted Hannah Gutierrez Reed. We're back to Gutierrez Reed. Like the defense asked to drop the read off of the Gutierrez and now we're back to Gutierrez. Can we pick a lane? Like I'll call you by whatever name you want, Hannah, but can we just keep it consistent? That's all I ask. Can we just like, you know, if, if Hilaria Baldwin wants to be called Hilaria Baldwin and her given name is Hillary, I don't really, I don't care. I will call you Hilaria. I will call you Hillary. I will call you Rachel. I will call you Raquel. Like you tell me we're all good, but can we just stay consistent or I'm going to get confused. A jury convicted Hannah of involuntary manslaughter and acquitted her of tampering with evidence. She faces up to 18 months incarceration. This court has discretion to fashion a sentence which combines punishment with rehabilitation, supervision, and monitoring. At the time of the sentencing hearing, Hannah will have spent just over a month in custody. In addition to the incarceration time, Hannah has endured and will continue to endure collateral consequences far harsher than most defendants ever must face. Okay. This includes an almost unprecedented press response to the case in New Mexico. Every lawyer. Every, every lawyer in a high profile case is like, this case has the most unprecedented amount of press coverage. Hannah's case does not. Hannah's case does not. Hannah's case does not. People were interested in Hannah's case because yes, it happened on a movie set, but because of Baldwin. And half the time when they talk about this case, they only talk about Baldwin. This is not unprecedented. This is not unprecedented media, but I understand that if you are looking at it in the context of high-profile cases, not. If you're looking at it in the context of every case that wanders into a criminal court building, yes, much more media than most criminal cases will ever get. Most people will never know that if somebody's been convicted of a crime or not. They just won't. Everyone knows about this. So I see both sides, but either way. Um, this includes an almost unprecedented press response to a case in New Mexico where hardly a month has gone by in the past two years without some kind of reporting on the case. Reporting related to her? No shade, just asking. The jury voir dire was a prime example when virtually every person in the jury room raised their hand about having heard something about the case. I mean, yeah, it happened in their community and it is an unprecedented case. This conviction and press deluge will forever impact her life going forward. Yeah, that that probably will, including with job prospects. I mean, she is now convicted of a manslaughter. So yes. Steven said, unprecedented coverage, Koberger's lawyers would like a word. Yeah, the Koberger attorneys are like, hold my beer. And then the Depp Heard case is like, hold the entire liquor store. Simply trying to lead a normal life again uh, and simply trying to lead a quote unquote normal life again someday. Well, lawyers, you're the one who let her phone number for the Gorilla Grip Pussy Pal phone get out on the internet. So because of the reporting, is blame the media now a defense tactic? It's like, it wasn't me. Those aren't my pants, but media. Hold my mega pint. That's better chat. Chat, that is way wittier. Chat, hold my mega pint. You are, you are correct. You are correct. <laughs> hold my mega pint. Um, it was a missed opportunity. Thank you for pointing it out. I feel, I feel better now. I feel like we've, we've elevated the leverage, of, the level of the humor. Because of reporting and having her personal data and information leaked to the press. Counsel. 
How do, how do you define leaked? Because this was a public trial. It was streamed and you didn't redact the phone numbers out of the exhibits. That's not on the press. Like, I'll hold the press to account when it's the press. That's not the press. That's not the press, Bowles. And having her personal data and information linked to the press, she has also received numerous threats, including death threats. Yeah, but don't send death threats. Like, I get it's fair. Predictably, all of this has caused her great anxiety, fear, and depression. I don't doubt that. She has sought and attended counseling to address these issues at Mojave Mental Health Clinic. This would be incredibly fucking stressful. Um, True said the prosecution did it, not the defense. The defense did not object to protect that information. Yes, the prosecution offered the exhibits. The defense did not redact the exhibits. I agree. Um, but the defense looked at the exhibits and went, yes, publish them. So the attorneys, all the attorneys, to be fair, all the attorneys. Um, though I did not love the prosecution's response, which was like, it's on them. It is, but also like the prosecute, to be fair, yes, the prosecution should have also caught it, but it was the defense's job to be the last stop there before uh, it got onto the, onto the screen. So either way, it is the attorneys that are at fault, all. Days after this tragedy occurred, Gutierrez Reed wanted to express her deep sadness regarding the tragedy and the death of Helena Hutchins, of Helena to the Hutchins family. Legal proceedings and the looming investigation, however, made that impossible. Though she has exercised her constitutional right to a jury trial, it does not mean she didn't and doesn't still feel incredibly saddened and heartbroken by what happened on that tragic day on the rest set. This might have been better taken by me before watching all of her interviews. The tragic series of events that unfolded that day destroyed and altered many people's lives. Agreed. Including Miss Reed's. I mean, agreed. The court has the incredible responsibility of weighing that a death did occur that day with all the other relevant sentencing factors, including Reed's history and personal characteristics, her work, her mental health history, substance use, and trauma she has endured in her young life. Many of the attached letters describe, uh, detail these additional facts and provide the court a more quote unquote holistic picture of the kind of person Ms. Gutierrez Reed is. Following the jury verdict, counsel have received numerous unsolicited emails and calls from around the country and the world from people expressing their support for Ms. Reed. We have been informed that people have mailed letters on their own to this court, and we ask the court consider all the sentiments expressed in these letters. I'm sure that the court will. They will at least put them in the file. Um, in computing a reasonable sentence that balances punishment with rehabilitation and the need for deterrence with the notion of fairness, including that Sarah Zachary received complete immunity and Dave Halls received six months of unsupervised probation on a misdemeanor. Very fair points. While Ms. Morrissey wasn't the one who reached the plea deal with Halls, it is still entered by the state and prior prosecutors. Yeah, and she has to deal with it. I don't like it either. I don't like it either. Ms. Reed has been gamefully employed for the past 10 years. She was a social media marketing assistant for companies from 2022 to 2024. Within the movie industry before that, Ms. Gutierrez Reed was an armorer and props assistant in various films, including Rust, in October of 2021. As an armorer on The Old Way from August to September 2021, as an armorer on Murder at Yellowstone City in March 2021, a vacation rental cleaner from 2019 to 2020, and an armorer on Once Upon a Time in Hollywood in 2017. She was also on the scent of Magnificent Seven in 2015 and Rue 21, 2014, 2015. She also helped her dad who was diagnosed with leukemia and has helped care for him when he needs help with various things. Several of the letters provide examples of her character, personal traits and work ethics. Um, Shond Crindlebra is Gutierrez's boyfriend and has known her since she was little. He states, quote, she's always helping people and going out of her way to make sure people are okay. She's a part of her community and always working to take care of her dad. Her aunt states, quote, she is kind and smart and the last person that should have been, that should be in jail. She also states that Gutierrez helps her mom at work and that her, and that, 
she helps her mom at work and that and her dad have a close relationship. John Harper Felsch has been a close friend of Gutierrez's since 2016. They've lived together as room. They've lived together with other roommates. Flesh Felsch states in his letter that Hannah would often be the first to welcome me into uncomfortable social situations and highlight my character to make me feel more welcome. She has fed me when I was hungry, when I had no money to purchase food for myself. Uh, Rani Hutchin Hutcherson, another friend of Gutierrez, states, quote, through our friendship, Hannah is a source of unwavering support and encouragement during some of my darkest moments. Whether I was grappling with relationship challenges or battling depression, Hannah is always there to offer a listening ear, sage advice, and comforting and a comforting presence while living over 20 hours away. Joey Merrigan, her employer, states, quote, Hannah demonstrated remarkable dedication, professionalism, and talent. She consistently produced high quality work and displayed a strong commitment to her responsibilities. Her creativity, attention to detail, sir. Her creativity, attention to detail, and ability to affect effectively engage with our audience were invaluable assets to our team. Outside her professional skills, I also had an opportunity to observe Hannah's personal qualities. She conducted herself with integrity, honesty, and reliability, earning the respect and trust of her colleagues and supervisors. Yes, this is after this happened, though. I understand this, this probably changed her, but this is actively, um, this is after. Colleen Hart, who has known Gutierrez for eight years, states that Gutierrez has volunteered to help clean, sand, and repaint her neighbor's deck. She volunteered to help raise money for local veterans council that is a nonprofit. In my experience, she is thoughtful and kind, well, is a thoughtful and kind human. Uh, Kelsey Hill, a friend of Gutierrez, states, quote, Hannah is a person of utmost integrity and moral character. She has always strived to uphold the principles of honesty, compassion, and responsibility in all aspects of her life. In the, the letters in total paint a picture of Hannah being kind, helpful, and hardworking. Okay. Kelly C. raised an excellent point in the chat and said, I think it's more impactful that it shows she's changed since. And I think that that is an excellent, is an excellent point. Um, again, the defendant, the state will paint a picture of the impact for the victims and the victim's family. It is the defense's responsibility to paint a picture of the defendant outside of this. Again, this is an involuntary manslaughter. This is a case where it is conceded in the charging that this was an accident born out of negligence and not a volitional uh, killing. So these types of letters are, um, expected in this case, truly. Sentencing and law request, New Mexico case law states that among the factors that may be considered when deciding the sentence are, quote, wait, are one, unusual aspects of the defendant's character, two, past conduct, age, health, any events surrounding the crime, three, pattern of conduct indicating whether he or she is a serious threat to society, does anyone think that Hannah Gutierrez is a serious threat to society at this point? Just chat, no, no shade either way, just, a, ju just asking. For the possibility of rehabilitation, however, a trial court is not limited to these factors. So this is what the court is going to balance. Who the defendant is, what the conduct is, what her criminal history is, if she's a serious threat to the community, if she can be rehabilitated, I mean, I, I would imagine that she is never going to be around a movie set again with this conviction and that she is going to be restricted from ever being around weapons again because of her conviction. I will have to check and see if involuntary manslaughter is a lifelong ban. So when the court's weighing these things, those are some of the, the considerations the court is going to make. Hannah Gutierrez Reed is a very different defendant than Daryl Brooks or Terrell, Taylor Shabiznis, right? When we look at the, or, or an Alec Murdaugh or a Tom Girardi, like when you look at the scope of the cases that even we talk about, there is a difference in these defendants. It doesn't change what happened, but on the scale of sentencing, that's considered. 
The specifics of the crime and the characteristics of the defendant are relevant to the sentencing court's exercise of its discretion. They go on to say, although the basic sentence is up to 18 months imprisonment, the court has discretion to grant a conditional discharge and provide Gutierrez an incentive to rehabilitate and comply with the requirements of the court. A sentence of conditional discharge may be imposed under Section 31 2013, which provides that, quote, interesting, when a person who has not previously, who has not been previously convicted of a felony offense is found guilty of a crime for which a deferred or suspended sentence is authorized, which it is here, the court may, without entering an adjudication of guilt, and she's already been found guilty, enter a conditional discharge order and place the person on probation in terms and conditions authorized by the code. A conditional discharge order may only be made when available once with respect to any person. This is something that a judge that I worked for loved to do. So defendants would come in and be like, Your Honor, I have seen the error of my ways. I will never be back in this court again. I just want a chance. And their defense attorneys would look at them and be like, you don't want to do this. You do not. You do not want to do this. And the judge would kind of grin and go, I will give you a chance. And I will give you a conditional sentence. And I am going to suspend the maximum penalty. And remember, in, in California state court, for a lot of crimes, you will serve fairly well less than half time. So somebody's facing two or three years then takes a conditional release for the max suspended, is then facing 10, 15, plus, 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 plus. And the defense attorneys would be like, do not, do not do this. This is, what you don't want to do is this. Do not, do not do this at all. Do not do this at all. Particularly if it is not your first rodeo. First rodeo, folks, it's different. But the defense attorneys are like, please, please don't. Just, you already have time served. You, you just take, the, no. And invariably, the defense is like, I want to do that. And the judge would suspend the maximum sentence with terms and conditions. And when people invariably violated their terms or conditions, the judge would bring them back in and be like, you had one chance, max, next case. And the defense attorneys are like, what did I tell you was going to happen? Just, if you had just taken two years, you would be out like in two weeks. This case is a little bit different because she was out of custody the entire pendency of this case with no issues. So a suspended sentence doesn't offend my senses because if she is on probation and goes through probation with rehabilitation, whatever, I don't think that this is a defendant that's particularly at risk for violating that. And then if she does, she can, she gets the 18 months. It's not, it's not an unreasonable ask in this case. This can be a probationary case. And instead of saying straight up, give her probation, they're saying give her probation with time suspended. So it is conditional. So your sentence is conditioned on this period of time that you don't get in trouble. And if you do that, then you don't get the 18 months. If you don't do that, then the hammer drops and, and go to prison. They say the legislature enacted the conditional discharge statute as an alternative to a suspended or deferred sentence. How is it to explain to me how it's different? Because I have been conflating the language. A conditional discharge order may only be made once with respect to any person. It may be given for an array of first time felony offenses, even those who are found guilty of a violent offense. Hmm. Um, if the person violates any of the conditions of probation, the court may, may enter an adjudication of guilt. Wait, there. Are, can you give a conditional discharge like this after a conviction, though? Okay, I was talking about suspended sentences. They are saying that a conditional disco, discharge will negate the conviction down the road. I want to be clear. I am fine with a deferred or suspended sentence in this case. After a jury conviction, I don't think you just upend the conviction and discharge the conviction after probation. So they are asking that the conviction be discharged. Can you do that after a jury conviction? Because 
This conditional sentence, we're now thinking law in real time. This conditional sentence is without entering an adjudication of guilt. This, I am so confused by what you're arguing, Bowles. This would normally be the circumstance where you come in early in a case, you don't plead guilty or not guilty, and before the case is adjudicated, you get a conditional release. That was something we did in juvenile very frequently. Sorry, you guys, I conflated. But you would give a conditional release before they pled guilty or not guilty, or you would take the plea and hold it so it wasn't entered on their record, then they would do the things they're supposed to do and then the case would go away. I don't know if you can do this after a jury conviction. These are normally pre-adjudication options. I'm not mad about a susp potential suspended sentence, but conditionally discharging the guilty verdict, I don't know if I agree with. The legislator enacted the conditional discharge as an alternative to a suspended or dis deferred sentence. It can only be made once with respect to any person, can be given for a variety of first-time offenses, and then it lists them. Ms. Gutierrez-Reed is eligible for conditional discharge. Where is the law that says you can do this after trial, though? That's my question. I need to see where you can do this after trial. A deferred sentence, a deferred sentence or suspended sentence is you get probation. And then if you mess up on probation, you get custody time. So we're deferring the sentence till down the road for you to do the things. And if you do the things, you're good. I don't know if you can do this. I'm interested to see what the state says. I don't know if you can do this after conviction. They say Gutierrez is eligible for conditional discharge. She has a complete lack of prior criminal history. Again, this is not my jurisdiction. So I have research that I need to do. I will give you the answer in quick bits by Monday before her sentencing. I'll have an answer for you. It is proper to consider her employment record. We know. The facts support a conditional discharge based on her lack of criminal history, her character, her support from the community, her relative youth, the devastating effect a felony will have. So they are asking to set aside the conviction in this. I need to know if you can do that after. A conditional discharge will require Gutierrez to abide by a set of conditions during the term of probation. Um, considering the circumstances and sentencing factors, including history, they say the proposed conditional discharge is warranted. Are you going to default to a suspended sentence or are you just going all in? A sentence with some period of incarceration followed by a term of probation is adequate to punish the offense, but no more serious than necessary. Yeah, but I don't think that's set, I don't think you set aside the conviction though. The pun what do you guys think? I'm fine with probation and a suspended sentence. That doesn't offend. I don't think you you get out from under the conviction though. What do you guys think? The punishment also furthers basic purposes of criminal punishment, deterrence, incapacitation, just punishment, and rehabilitation. Um, and then the Letters and emails are attached. Um, from, oh, no. Okay. Hold on. Damn it, Bowles. Some of these have um, personal information attached to them. I'm not going to pull them up. <sighs> Bowles! These letters aren't redacted for public filing. I'm glad the law nerds are the law nerds, but the internet. Did you tell people when they submitted letters that you weren't going to redact out their phone numbers when you posted this and their addresses? <sighs> Bulls. Let's do a quick summary because um, that was a roundabout way to get to the answer with what the defense is asking for. In the Hannah Gutierrez case, the defense is asking for a conditional sentence. No, I said that wrong. Hold on, I'm pulling it up. Again, I'm gonna read it directly from the thing. Emily, just swoop again and go for, go from the um, 
go from the filing. Again, this is why my brain is paused. I don't think you can do this after conviction. And he didn't even address it at all. Um, let's try that again. Hannah Gutierrez Reed's defense attorney is arguing that she is entitled to a conditional discharge, meaning she would get a term of probation. There would be a prison sentence that may be suspended. But at the end of that, her conviction would be discharged, different than a suspended sentence where the conviction stands. She does probation. If there are issues on probation, then she could get the suspended amount of time. So either way, he is arguing for probation. I am not clear from Bowles's filing if the law supports a conditional discharge after a jury verdict. I will be taking a look at that and answering that question during quick bits. We'll see what the prosecution has to say about this. She will be sentenced on Monday. I believe that is April 15th, and I will be covering the sentencing hearing then. They've set aside about two hours for it. And chat with that, I am sorry that I have to jam. I have an appointment that I absolutely have to make. Nor in the chat, I had to highlight this comment, Nor said I'm a trans guy, but my name is now Elizabeth. If you guys weren't on the members only, that's where that comes from. Um, Brianna B77 said I'm the CFO of a biological consulting firm. Just send me the link. I am. Okay. Um, specializing in surveys and research for threatened and endangered birds. Love the bird cams. I do too. And we will list them all below. So I have an appointment I have to get to. I'm sorry that I'm not going to get to all the super chats and questions. I will be back with that the next time we stream. Don't forget to download the app. I have got to run. Law nerds, thank you. We're going to roll the, in the outro for real for real this time. I will see you guys on Monday. Don't forget to get the app. Bye. You can stay up to date with everything I'm covering and fast notifications on our free iOS and Android app at lawnerdapp.com or search the app store for Law Nerd. You can also follow me around social media. And don't forget to check out my podcast, The Emily Show, with quick bits dropping every Monday, summarizing everything I do here on the live streams on Tuesday and Thursday for when you just have time for the quick bits. Thanks for being a Law Nerd.